in economics at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. His dis dissertation work focuses on monopsony um, with research interest in the domain of labor and political economy of development and applications to inequality and underemployment. Um, Rebecca will post the full profiles in the chat so you can read through them. Uh, Surbi is an assistant professor of economics at Azim Premji University um, in India. Her research areas include political economy, uh, development economics, labor economics, and particularly informality, exclusion, and structural transformation in labor surplus economies. Um, again, uh, Rebecca will put the full profile in the chat, uh, but I'm really glad that we have these two speakers. I know they're both really busy, so I'm going to hand over to them uh, to chat to us a little bit, uh, and we will have time for engagement after that. Thanks so much, um, Sherry, for the for setting up um, and for organizing the work around here. Uh, so, Surbhi and I are going to be talking uh, at the same time. <laughs> um, uh, and it's, it seems like uh, the, uh, we're, quite, we're, we're a nice uh, uh, small group, so it means that we can be a bit more interactive. Uh, I, I see a lot of people on the, a lot of the than me certainly about this so uh, it will be really great to have um, as much interaction as possible um, so I'm going to share a screen of just uh, something that uh, Subin and I are going to be speaking to um, uh, can I get an indication uh, Shara if, if you're if you're seeing this yes we can see you Hassan Okay, cool. Um, so, since this is, uh, uh, you know, set in, in, in South Africa, we just wanted to um, just set the scene on some very familiar historical uh, uh, facts about what's led to South Africa's development path, um, and especially in terms of labor. Uh, and then we'll get into the meat of exactly how does this relate to economic theory and, and how we all feel about whether the economic theory actually uh, covers what's actually um, been experienced historically in South Africa. Uh, so the first, so we we're thinking of really uh, dividing the session up into two, two big questions. The first big question being around development and what's happened to development, especially in terms of employment. And then the second question looking at um, identity and, and we'll, we'll, we'll split across that. But onto this first question of development, there's the, you know, very well known to a lot of people. Can I just get an indication of, of does, does, does everyone know what the, the NDP is? Um, you can quickly explain because not everyone is from South Africa. Right. Uh, it's a national development plan, very, very well discussed uh, uh, in South Africa. Um, and the point was that it was a very ambitious plan around, put it out, out around 2010 for what is South Africa going to look like in, in 2030. And there were these massive goals that really said, for example, uh, for employment, there was a, an objective that, uh, well, they saw that unemployment was around 25% in, in June 2012. And they said by 2020, we're going to be by 6%, 2020 now, uh, and uh, by 2030, um, uh, sorry, 14% by 2020 and 6% by 2030. And then a similar massive ambitious goal for GDP, um, uh, gross domestic product should increase by two and a half times um, with an average annual growth of, of, of five, five and a half percent. Now, this is a very well-known story that this has completely failed. Um, if you look at a historical trajectory, uh, you can see over here that um, uh, if you look at the unemployment rate uh, first, uh, we're looking, 2012 was around 25% over here. Remember, it was supposed to go down to, to around uh, 15, 14% in 2020 and around 6% in 2030. We've just continued straight along this path, even increased a lot. And after COVID, we've really hiked up a lot. Um, uh, unemployment has increased massively uh, in the last six months. 
But you know, part of the story is also the rest of the story of, of the country, of, of the world, that there has been GDP growth, massive GDP growth, if you just look at the top income percentiles. So if we just uh, focus on, on these uh, most recent um, uh, period, we can see here that if you focus on the blue, which is the, um, But the blue is the, uh, uh, the top 1%. Um, there's been a massive increase in this share for the top, top 1%. And this really uh, uh, increases a lot through the, through, it's not captured here because the data ends uh, earlier on, um, but it does increase, increase through. And for, the, and for the middle 40%, there's been a, like a strong decrease in the share. So the point, the, the point here is that there has been realization of this, uh, this goal of, uh, increasing income by two and a half times by 2030 if you just look at the top income percentiles. And that's really the whole question of inequality in South Africa. Uh, so at this point, just wanted to quickly uh, elicit some reactions of what do you, did anyone, uh, does anyone remember the, the, the NDP coming out and what, what did people think uh, of the NDP at, at, at that point? Whether it was realistic and why not? Uh, Isan, I'm just going to change the settings so that people can unmute themselves uh, yes. because at the moment we've set it um, differently. Um, so um, allow participants. Yeah, so it's changed. So, so please do just unmute yourself and, and, and jump in. There's only a few of us, so just uh, say. Um, but while people are thinking maybe, um, I mean, the economic theory was really not, was really in line with this, with this NDP. This is, this is from the NDP. Uh, over here, you can see that there's this kind of circle that they put out and it's really very close to the, the kind of virtuous circle that's put out in, in, in uh, like the most neoclassical uh, models of trickle down growth you increase profits, you lead to expansion of firms, those firms then employ more workers and get rising incomes in a, in a wonderful story of growth leads to employment. Um, yeah. Um, Subi, do you know? Um, thanks, Exxon, and um, thanks, Shaira, and the entire team for uh, having me here. I'm really excited to engage with all of you on this rather important topic and uh, probably something that um, is has relevance pretty much across the world and particularly so among, uh, you know, all the developing economies, which is what makes it important also, I feel, to engage as scholars from Global South who are interested in this particular topic uh, beyond the national boundaries. Because we've kind of followed a similar story and uh, even though there are certain different trajectories but there are a lot of similarities as well that I'm going to try to point towards taking off from what uh, Ixan said in terms of this virtuous cycle what forms the basis of uh, development economics uh, is in you know follows from Arthur Lewis's 1954 famous work which was about the unlimited supplies of labor where the argument was that a developed economy is distinct from a developing one in terms of its economic structure where a developed economy where a developing economy has this huge traditional or pre-capitalist or non-modern sector, whereas, and, uh, and, and a small modern sector, which is capitalist in nature and, you know, its formal sector uh, is uh, how we understand it today. But it was expected that over time with economic growth, as this modern sector expands, which is what Iksan talked about in terms of the expansion of the firm, and that is how, you know, that main theory that he's talking about in terms of policy framework is backed up by this really important theory. And what happened is that uh, the idea was that as growth happens and this modern sector expands, as these firms expand, the labor that was uh, that used to find employment in this agricultural or non-capitalist segments would be drawn out and be absorbed in these modern formal sector. 
However, despite, you know, uh, in, in various economies, there being high economic growth, like particularly so in India, uh, there, this informal employment has not gone away. So it has manifested itself in terms of either informal employment in India or in case of South Africa, a huge, um, in, I mean, informal as well as a huge pool of unemployment as well. So this idea of transition and transformation that we were talking about has not really materialized. Rather, what has started happening is, uh, even if people were to move out of this traditional or non-capitalist, so the way I use non-capitalist here in terms of family-based enterprises, which could persist in agriculture or other sectors, where employment is not mediated by any sort of wage labor relations, where you know there's a lot of petty commodity production happening just with household labor. So that was the standard idea of development that we, the uh, the developed countries, uh, I mean, posited by along the lines or the model of the developed economies, which the developing countries were uh, then expected to uh, follow. Uh, sorry, Iksan, I can't see the screen. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, so that's, that's fine. Yeah. Oh, no, no, it was fine. It was just uh, the screen, but okay, I'll go on. So basically, that was, uh, that was was the standard idea of development that was being followed. But what process, it has not happened. Of course, in case of South Africa, it becomes even more interesting because it's not experienced the high growth of the kind that India has. So are we saying that growth were the answer? And this is something that we would like to go into some bit for discussion. But I'm talking from a perspective that even when growth did happen, this absorption of labor did not happen in the formal sector in India. Interestingly, what has started happening is that now this informal employment, which is, you know, kind of labor vulnerability, precarity, and these workers not having, uh, you know, uh, not being able to unionize in the workspace, that is something where majority of employment in, I mean, or rather a high proportion of workers find employment. Now, this is the pool of workers that were expected to be absorbed in that virtuous cycle that Iksan is talking about. But interestingly, what happens is that it's, it's seen that these economies did not really undergo that Louisian transformation. That is why this informal employment exists. These are the remnants of uh, the, uh, you know, these are the remnants of this traditional segment and the non-capitalist segments and uh, broadly that sort of an idea. But what has started happening is that even in the global north, there has been an increase in informality and precarity. And that is what is basically um, something that makes this problem almost a global problem now. That we are unable to, not only are we unable to solve this problem in the global south, rather there's a re-emergence of this problem in the global north as well, making this issue of labor and its relation to development a global issue. And it is this sort of a relation that, at least in my opinion, kind of becomes one of the underpinning or one of the central problems that we need to explore in order to understand the relation of labor and work. Iksan, do you want to... Uh, yeah, just to add that, um, two things. Firstly, that, that I mean, just to, to get an idea for South Africa, something like 33%, uh, a third of all workers are classified as, as uh, informal. Uh, and that means that um, these workers are not bound, for example, uh, uh, as, uh, are, are not uh, as regulated, so don't, in today's terms, would not uh, be fought under the national minimum wage and so on. And really, you can think about that informal labor force in two different segments, which, which Suvi also uh, uh, mentioned. One segment, which is about the informal sector, and that's about producing, uh, you know, it's about like side of the road goods and, and selling stuff. Uh, and then the other uh, kind of for, uh, type of informal labor, which is the kind of uh, informal, if you're looking at within uh, the uh, formal sector, um, you, you, you find workers that are kind of not at all paid the, the national minimum wage, not a, are not given written contracts uh, and so on. Very common, for example, uh, in outsourced industries, very common in, uh, in agriculture and, and, and so on. So, um, uh, the second thing is that, uh, actually, let, let's, let's maybe um, 
ask directly for anyone who wants to put input of what, why do you think there's, there's such high unemployment in South Africa? Um, like for yourself and also for what uh, kind of uh, economics says. Um, in any thoughts, um, even just starting off with what, what, what was taught in, in, in courses, for example. Uh, if you are shy to speak, you can just put your thoughts in the chat. But we're just 16 of us, okay. so don't be shy. Um, can I, I think, I think Precious had something. Go ahead. Oh, yes. Um, well, they say that um, we, people lack skills, the necessary work experience to actually get jobs. Even now it's education to say that they have education that is irrelevant to what the labor market needs. Um, it's also structural that we can link into, you know, the, the pre-apartheid period. So, yeah, there's a lot of reasons. Yeah. That, For yeah. Me, this education story is like super fundamental to South Africa and to me, complete nonsense. Um, but it is something that's like so widely taught and, 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 and thought about in terms of policy, the policy uh, space. Uh, and and uh, like, it's, it's very much exactly what, 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 what uh, is completely common in, in, in courses and so on. Uh, so it's a perfect point to, to, to bring yeah. up. What strikes me um, or what struck me as an economic student is that despite looking at labor econ economics and thinking about uh, what was taught um, from a more conscious lens, it didn't equip you with the confidence to try and ask these difficult questions. And this is the perennial question, I think, for us. Why yes. is unemployment so high when there's so much work to do, when there's so much development that needs to happen as well? Um, and I use the word development very uh, reluctantly, yeah. like many of us. Um, but even concepts like precarity, we've not really owned them in terms of understanding them through our, our context, where precarity is the norm and not the exception. Um, you know, so that's something else that comes to mind. Right. I, I think Lee had, had something to say. Sorry, I, I, I can't see while everyone, everyone, everyone's speaker, so please do just jump in. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'll try and be brief. Um, this question has kind of obsessed me for the last uh, few months um, because what you learn at an undergraduate level doesn't answer um, unemployment, the, the why is South Africa unemployment so high. When I spent some time in China, it was something that always struck people um, in China that like, how can you have a country with 30% unemployment? It's, it's crazy. And um, I suppose my own understanding or research is that you, you have to go back to like 1970 where you have the last kind of like census data that was reliable before you kind of have this black hole of data in the 80s and 90s. And it seemed that it, 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 around that time, you actually had um, a labor shortage problem, um, according to Seekings and Natras. Um, and the apartheid, yeah, which is just mad. Like I can't, I can't conceptualize such a world, but um, but it's not, right? It's, it's, it's an apartheid labor shortage problem. It's a labor shortage of white people. Yeah, well, so, Which is, like, again, this is just based on what I'm reading. Um, no, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. Not so, something, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot to... But uh, yeah. what was interesting for me is that the part of the government kind of seemed to um, see that black people didn't want to work on, on farms in essentially slave labor conditions. Yes. And they, they had, like in many developing countries, this sort of uh, um, subsistence farming backup option. So if you couldn't get a, a job in the city in, a, in an industry, you could maybe still work on farms. And they were like, no, uh, let's just take away the land and force them to work on farms, um, which happened. And then, ironically, in about the 80s, the apartheid government decided, no, um, we need to be more capital intensive. So we're going to we're going to put. Um, sort of tariffs, in, um, you can write off your tax on new equipment really easily. So then all of this labor that they forced basically to work on farms is then substituted by capital. And so you come into 1994 and you have this, um, this unemployment problem already existing. And then after 1994, you eventually, the way 
unemployment is measured, um, you know, suddenly you have all these women entering the, um, the labor sector for the first time. And I think it might be similar to what you see now with the latest uh, quarterly labor force survey results where before, the reason that unemployment has technically gone down in this latest stats SA report is because people can't actually go and look for work. And so I think post 1994, you had all these people who were not actually able to look for work before entering, which caused the spike. And then there's all sorts of problems around industrialization that is super capital intensive in South Africa, that we have no light industry. Uh, but yeah, I've said a lot, I'm gonna stop. Yeah, I mean, the methodology of our statistics in itself can be questioned when it comes to looking at labor more broadly. Um, thanks so much, Lee. Back to you, Hassan. And so um, this is like, uh, yeah, this is completely excellent. Um, I, I agree completely that the, that the historical origins of these is, is so important. Uh, in, in South Africa, it's like kind of mad to think about unemployment without thinking about the historical origins, because as you say, it's, it's exactly the, the, the uh, if you, even, if you, if, even if you believe the Luwisian model, which, which uh, Serbia has, has, has well argued that, that it's, uh, there's a lot left to be desired there, um, the, the, it's kind of like you don't have this, 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 uh, this backup option of land because that was taken away forcibly through removals. Um, uh, you know, in, in multiple waves, both in terms of the rural sector as well as the kind of uh, during a, uh, apartheid through the, through the uh, disposition of urban land. Um, and it's kind of, it's mad to think about unemployment without thinking about the land problem, without thinking about the spatial problem, which is, is kind of, well, where is that uh, in, in the courses? We, we, we get back to, as Pesha said, um, we get back to uh, something like education, which, I mean, uh, just, to, just to say something, uh, I, I, in my own research, I look a lot of, at firms, and one statistic that really strikes me is that if you think about the gender wage gap, for example, just as one illustration, something like half of the gender wage gap is accounted for by things nothing to do with education. It's only to do with people being able to, men being able to find better jobs than women, for example, because women have, for example, more uh, care responsibilities or more spatially bound, for example. And the same thing, the same statistics really come, come through for if you look at uh, by class as well, if you look at kind of the middle share of, of income versus the lower share of income, a very small percentage, in fact, less than half of, of the variance in wages is accounted for by differences in education. This, the story of education is, is kind of like, it's great for the neoclassical model, but it doesn't work in South Africa because really what's driving the differences in South Africa is our historical um, uh, inequalities. As you can see here, we do get growth for the top 5%, but that 95% is very much a story of, of, um, of apartheid-based uh, uh, disposition carrying on into, into our current period, which everyone knows except for economic classes, it seems. Um, sorry, that was a rant. Uh, does anyone else want to, uh, Siri, do you, do you want to go on? Do you want to continue? Or? Um, thanks, Aksan. Yeah, just kind of following up on your point. One is in terms of, you know, this dispossession that Exxon talks about, that people's agricultural lands are being taken away and they do not have any resources to subsist on. So which becomes like, you know, the classic Marxian story where he talks about uh, that in order for you to develop the kind of economic system that we have today, there are two preconditions that are needed. So one is in terms of create, I mean, so basically what you need is to create a doubly free labor. Now, what is this doubly free labor? Labor, who is free? So in that sense, in capitalism, the labor is free because you're not a slave, you're not a serf, you're not tied to the land. You're free to sell your labor power to whoever you want. But also you are free of any means of production. Like you do not own any land or any machinery. So you do not have any option but to go and actually sell your labor power to the capitalist. And that is what is the doubly free labor, which kind of forms the basis of the current economic system that we have. Now, this dispossession that Exxon talked about is basically, you know, people's land being taken away. So you don't even have another option. It's not just a prehistoric condition that happens. What like increasingly work coming from India and others have been arguing is that this is a constant thing 
this sort of expropriation kind of keeps happening where people are dispossessed of these resources time and again. And this can happen not just in terms of land resources, information resources, availability of credit. We're going to talk about a bit in next section that how then this case aggravated the moment you add identity in the question of labor, which relates to the second point that Iksan raised about you know, the gender wage gap and everything. So this reminded me of an interesting thing. I think you had one of the speakers who's uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Amit Basfale, in one of uh, the talks as well. So he has this interesting work on saying that the moment you start measuring skills based on education, you're doomed because skills and education would not necessarily have a relation that you expect it to be. In fact, a lot of, you know, quote unquote, traditional skills, which are which could be about, which could relate to textile sector, etc are basically skills that were passed down by generation but we've created these sort of formal structures and those become the only kind of structures through which we want to follow how skills are measured and as a result these traditional skills are so undervalued that all the industries which actually could use these skills they 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 actually pay very low wages to these workers because they're not educated whereas you don't need education to do the kind of uh, you know the, the stuff and anyway i guess that, that takes us to a different dimension and what is the role of education is the role of education simply to be able to go, be a good worker and sell yourself or basically become a critical thinker per se so and that is i think also a kind of project that has evolved over you know now various decades now this kind of uh, you know, education becoming just a product of what you go and sell in the market. And that is, and that's why, you know, these, uh, what Shaira also raised in terms of how data is measured and how everything's happening. It's the way we have attached meaning to these things is something that it was not supposed to be. And the way education is then increasingly seen in the way it is, it's something that's a constructed thing and there's nothing pre-given about it. And yeah, so just a few points. And uh, I, I guess there was a question in the chat, uh, but uh, yeah. Um, so I guess I'll come back to it in a while. I can't find it. Um, we'll find it. Oh, yeah. So there's a question. Okay. 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 All right. Um, Sorry, I guess, yeah, so this is a question by Lei again, uh, who says that what sectors and skill demand, what sectors and skill demands have seen this growth in India? Is there a mismatch in terms of skill demanded by the growing sector of the economy and the skills education profile in the Indian informal sector? So, you know, this is something that people say that, okay, is this just about the question of skills? There's not enough skills. First of all, in India, 93% of employment is informal in nature. So even with our decades of high growth, even if South Africa has not registered that we have, what we still have is 93% people to actually then, and there are people who have graduate education working in informal sector with inform, or with the informal wage contract of the kind that Iksan talked about, earning barely minimum subsistence wages. So it's not just a question. I mean, skill of course is a part of it, but that's a very skill mismatch is a very small part of the entire problem here we are talking about the problem of labor demand and that's what it kind of boils down to i also just want to say that it's the level of education the level of education required is kind of like who decided that you, that South africa as an economy needed a, a, a high level of education what like why, why don't we all need a lower level of education that's, uh, that follows a different trajectory? And that's like the answer is very clearly, um, as, as, as uh, Lee uh, uh, said earlier, it's, it's very clearly linked to uh, earlier apartheid policies of trying to make sure that the whole economy runs off the uh, small white minority, which is like an impossible thing to do uh, unless you make sure that, that you have low labor intensity. Uh, and so then coming out of apartheid, we inherited all these formal sector firms and institutions that relied on low labor uh, intens in intensity. In other words, that required high education. Um, but that, well, as Suri said, it's very much a constructed thing. It's not something that was, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, that's completely, the, the, the alternative paths. Yeah. Um, so if I may just add. Go ahead, Sylvie. 
Sorry, Iksan. Oh, okay. If I may just add something to it. So this was just a discussion that we were having earlier and we weren't sure if to, but I think this is the right time to probably bring that up. So uh, there's this really interesting uh, article by um, Smith and uh, Hotry, if I'm not wrong, who talk about this issue of the prison industrial complex. So if, you know, more and more people now what's started happening is a lot of these multi-billion dollar companies and fortune 500 companies are moving their production to prisons where they pay less than minimum wages to the prison inmates and actually get them to produce the products which is then sold out okay and the classic case here is basically the example that i'll take from iksan in terms of education and constructed concepts and everything so these are the people who the society deemed should be uh, ostracized, should be, uh, are, you know, there's a disenfranchisement and these are the people who should be kept segregated and be living in ghettos because this incarceration is particularly happening, I mean, in the US context for a very specific uh, color of people for, for actually having in terms of racial segregation that's happening. So the incarcerated people happen to be increasingly uh, blacks and Latino population. And with that, when this is happening, these are the people who are then said like, like, you know, you are not good enough to be exploited by the labor market, but rather that these are the people who are then being uh, exploited, quote unquote, you know, Marxian exploitation in terms of labor being extracted for production itself. So then of course, the problem is not whether they're good enough to, uh, you know, be producing or not, whether they're skilled enough to be producing or not. The question here is of something else that we need to recognize. Um, maybe it's at the point. Sorry. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm starting to 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 uh, go through talking and looking at the chat. Uh, but um, don't worry too much with, about the chat. Um, we'll we'll keep an eye on it. If any questions okay, come directly to you, I'll let you know. Perfect. Uh, I just. Um, I want to make one more point, which is about the uh, the, the economic trajectory that we've been choosing over since 1994 is very much the outcome of political contestation. So it's kind of like, why did we choose to continue the growth path such that, as we've seen, the top five percent have had massive growth, even in the last ten years, when the rest of the country has been close to recession, um, whereas media like most people's incomes have really not grown in the last 30 years. Uh, and that's very much a kind of uh, a choice that was uh, made through political contestation uh, by the uh, policies adopted. Uh, you inherit a, a structure of the economy in 1994, but there was a kind of decision to, to some degree not challenge it that much. Um, I want to open up now for, for uh, maybe to ask directly to, to, to everyone in the room. What do you, uh, I don't know Surabhi, if you think this is the right point uh, to do this. What, what do you think of the growth project? Um, and I mean, for, 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 uh, not, not, not that there's, uh, it sounds like a loaded question after this discussion, uh, but there, there is a big question of like, you know, we, we want growth in our economy. Um, and uh, we want the, the mass increases in, in living standards, uh, but the questions are kind of multiple, like what do we have to sacrifice to get that growth? Can we get that growth? And when that growth comes, do incomes rise? Um, but there's a project associated with growth, some of which for me personally, I do buy into, uh, some of which uh, I don't buy into, and especially actually for over the last few months of COVID, and I've rethought a lot of the, a lot of the questions personally around growth. Um, but if, if we can get any thoughts on what do you think of the growth project? That's very vague, but um, uh, if you want more specific things, are there, are, are, are there aspects of the growth project that are worth pursuing? Uh, what are the aspects of the growth project that are not worth pursuing? Um, 
So Josh put in the comments, can we talk about growth without talking about distribution? Growth for who? Can I come in, colleagues? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think growth is important to the extent that uh, it enables the state to derive income through taxation from the corporates. And obviously, hoping that the income will be used correctly uh, to build hospitals, provide basic services, and, and what have you. Experience in South Africa has been that uh, even though we have had growth, the kind of growth that we've had, especially early during the, the time of Tabombe, when the economy grew from between 5 to 7 percent, it was largely jobless growth. And so the sort of outcomes that we, we envisaged did not accrue. So it seems to me that oftentimes the, the question or the project of growth, as you're putting it, Isan, is advanced by people who you know, believe in the neoclassical ideal of what uh, should happen. That is to say, allow the corporates the space to do what they want to do and allow the state to derive incomes from the corporates to provide uh, basic uh, services. Thanks, Isai. Right, yeah. I mean, for me, just to, just to plug into a, a different conversation, which is about the, uh, which um, some of us uh, very much share, for example, uh, uh, on, the, on the basic income guarantee, uh, that's very much to me what, what, what what part of the part of the kind of settlement is? It's like if you ta if you get more money from firms that are able to grow, uh, you can then tax it and redistribute it, uh, which uh, Buso is is how I interpret what you said, um, which has advantages in terms of, uh, you know, it means you can allow for the ca the like capitalist development to be unleashed, but has disadvantages also because. We haven't seen that unleashing happened, happen, and secondly, it's fundamentally a little bit uh, disempowering to make to allow for growth only to happen in the in the in the kind of formal sector, formal firms, whereas by its nature, it's excluding uh, in terms of actual in terms of a kind of empowering productivity. Uh, it's exclusive for for against the the rest of the population. I don't know. Any other thoughts um, on the growth project? I think we need extensive industrial policy to actually grow. And I think that the thing is education doesn't exactly raise productivity or export competitiveness without an industrial structure that actually backs it up. Um, I think that that should be limited. I think it should come with welfare growth. It should be aimed towards cooperatives where possible and it should be environmentally friendly and green orientated where possible but i think we do need extensive industrial policy in like manufacturing to actually grow Sammy, do you want to because i know your thoughts are very much against industrial policy even though i'm 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 kind of on the fence on it i wouldn't say completely against but i can talk about reasons why it probably did not happen in several uh, countries and whether so i guess i have two points to raise here one in terms of countries that did follow successfully you know successfully industrialized those are the questions that i was raising that us is the prime example of it and that is why we are talking about how there's been an increase in informality precarity and actually a fall in real wage uh, levels you know real wages for the us uh, despite having undergone the industrial policy. This is not to say, of course, that one doesn't uh, do it. Of course, if one can, in the current climate, that's where my inhibition would 
come at. Whether we can do it in the current uh, sort of climate, in the global climate, is one part of the uh, uh, argument that I'm making. And the second part of the argument is that even for the countries that did undergo this sort of industrialization, a lot of issues that, you know, what Shaira said, that this is the normal employment. So what we call normal is now, you know, emerging there as the non-normal or the not standard employment is and that is something that that uh, does basically bringing up the problems that we have been facing for for the longest of time now for the first part where i was saying that in the current climate will an industrial uh, uh, you know industrial revolution and an industrial uh, policy industrialization be pos possible or not um there comes this basic question of even when there is, let's say, industrialization, are we expecting there to be labor intensive industrialization or are yeah. we still expecting it to be extremely capital intensive yeah. such that it wouldn't transform into what we really need in terms of real changes, you know, material changes for people. And second thing is that even when so india has been following this sort of dilution of labor uh, laws increasingly particularly after the pandemic which in the current policy climate is the worst thing to do probably and uh, so if you have more informalized wage workers who are uh, kind of you know becoming a part of the industries that come up that doesn't take us anywhere because what is going to happen as a result of this process i mean if it happens in the current climate what we are expecting is resources to again be taken up from these traditional resource, uh, segments that I was talking about from agriculture and other places while the labor or the workers that are dispossessed and were uh, finding employment in the traditional segment if they are in fact not absorbed because of low capital intense, uh, intensity what we have is again that pool of unemployed people who are not able to find employment here so that is how like so, so that's why I would be really skeptical of whether in the current growth in capital intensity and seven profit driven kind of climate where direct things for security of labor as well as for uh, distribution is not done would just an industrial policy take us where we want to i have my skepticism for the reasons i mentioned hmm. Exan, do you want to, uh... no I, I i think that's that's well covered uh, i see there are a couple of questions here uh, from both mafuz and from precious about uh, focusing on welfare compared to focusing on economic growth, um, which uh, really reminds me, Surbi, of the discussion in Sanyal uh, about the development discourse. I, I know you're, you'd be much better placed to, to speak to that. Please go ahead. I'll add as in when, uh, if I have to add anything. Oh. Um, just that I, I, I mean, in the, in, in the development discourse, uh, there is a kind of, there was a shift from growth itself between 1960 to 1980, uh, maybe 90, towards something that's more about like, uh, if some of you are familiar with SIN's kind of uh, um, multiple criteria of, of welfare. So like you look at education, you look at life expectancy, you look at a number of, of outcomes, and you say, and you see, uh, are these improving? So these are the real outcomes, uh, kind of entitlements and and capabilities approach, for the buzzwords. Um, but uh, I mean, part of this is that it's kind of like a little bit strange because this shift in the discourse from economic growth towards welfare happens precisely at the time where you get a failure of the of the economic growth project. 1960 to 1980, you get 1960s, you have this incredible wave of decolonization across the continent. You have uh, enormous uh, kind of plans across many kind of inspiring examples of industrialization and it works for a decade or so. You're hit in the 1970s by this kind of debt crisis. It kind of demolishes a lot of these countries um, and you have the classic story of structural adjustment programs and kind of people are like, oh, actually this growth project, industrialization project didn't work. Um, what can we revert to? We can revert to a kind of um, poverty metric, which really kind of to date makes very marginal changes about like, oh, and, and, the, and the kind of favorite tool is something like RCTs. If you take a poll here, do you, are you more likely to have extra year of education 
And so, I mean, I think in theory, the welfare outcome is really good. But in terms of development practice in the discourse, it's come out in a kind of, um, like in a scary way, uh, where the, 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 it's kind of undermined some of the, of the, of the more important question is of this, there are kind of like structural elements that are preventing the wholesale development of the, of a society, because precisely within this focus on the welfare, uh, the welfare metric in the development discourse, there's very little critique of the capitalist system. Um, at least that's my reading of, of one of the problems of, of, of how the development discourse has, has focused on welfare. Surabhi, I don't know. Just a couple uh, more points. So just kind of building up on what Iksan said uh, before we move on to maybe the next topic is, uh, so, you know, the moment we, there was this, if you look at international labor organization around 80, similar to this shift in discourse that Iksan's talking about, what starts happening is that from these things about structural transformation and industrialization, we have a shift towards something called a, said decent work agenda where you're saying look what we need to do is provide decent work so it's some sort of a subtle or a hidden sort of acceptance that look that promise of the system that we were talking about that with industrialization this trickle down and growth that were expected to happen or with these structural shifts how this problem was supposed to be solved is kind of withdrawn Rather, now the question is whether you're in informal sector, whether you're in formal sector, we don't care. Our main thing is just, uh, you know, decent work. But the problem is this issue of decent work is also very closely linked with this issue of industrialization and the kind of system that we have. This sort of moving away of the two and is, 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 was actually this sort of what Iksan said, the failure of the growth process and the transformation process, which then came to be, you know, almost raising hands up. Look, that, that is not happening. So let's now look at these small interventions and hope that they will make any changes. And that is what we see has actually not happened for so the what we talk about a fall in the poverty in the world that's just come from two countries india and china that's where the fall in poverty numbers for most of the world is coming from so much of that has actually not materialized in fact what starts happening in much of latin america is this lost decade having a lot of these economic shocks being given to these economies without really much resultant uh, improvement in the material conditions of people um, so, Isanti, wanted to go on to. Yeah. Let's have one more comment and then move on. Yeah. May I come in, Isan? Yeah, go ahead. Last comment. Um, I want to, to respond. I wanted to, to put myself on video because I wanted to share with you um, a, a, a two books. Uh, you might know them. In fact, uh, I want to respond to Precious comment, which um, paraphrase basically says, why not discuss the issue of growth because it has been elusive and pursue welfareism. Uh, in our part of the world, in the global south, I think the, the immediate response would be, you cannot distribute nothing. So you, you need economic growth first before you can distribute. Um, but there is now a groundswell of theoretical work by people like um, Joseph Hanlon, is uh, just give money to the poor. And James Ferguson, give men a fish. And they are saying that uh, taking the experience from the West, they are saying that Cash transfers through a welfare system have now been considered as an effective and normal means of addressing poverty. And I, I do concur with colleagues who say that. I think we need to begin to strengthen the welfare system in South Africa and elsewhere in the global South, because this issue of growth and growth, we've been talking about it for years now, and we don't seem to be achieving anything. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, and I think if can I just jump in? Go ahead. Yes, and I think in agreement with uh, it's Mbusa, right? Honestly, I mean we've been chasing growth for the past I don't know decades, 
right? And I mean, in, in South Africa's case, you know, the economy has established this, you know, years of, of slow economic progress. I mean, growth rates below 3%. So my, my, I feel like perhaps we need to change the primary goal, you know, and start looking at welfare, like, um, you know, strengthening the welfare system, giving, uh, you know, um, grants to, to low income earners. To, to, so honestly, I feel like perhaps we, we just need to change the primary goal. We're not discarding growth completely. We still need it, but just changing the priority, right? From, from being just chasing growth, because we are clearly not attaining it at all. And uh, I speak from uh, the perspective of South Africa. So, so I, wanna, I wanna make one more comment. I'm sorry, I'm abusing my role here. Um, that, you know, I, I mean, obviously agree, there's too much focus on growth and so on. But I, re I really want to just say that the, the answer of cash transfers by itself, I, I think cash transfers are very important. A basic income guarantee would be really great and important in the African context, especially right now. But that by itself for me is completely inadequate because I really can't think through the political economy implications of a future trajectory of South Africa where you have a, a smaller and smaller um, formal sector of employed workers holding all the productive capacity of the country and you have transfers in, I mean, we're thinking about the trajectory of the development that you have transfers really allowing the rest of the country to subsist. It's a kind of dystopia to me that of, of the most, of the worst kind of imbalance of power possible, where at the end of the day, who, how do you determine bargaining power? If you have all the productive capacity, the state only has so much, only has so much political power to be able to redistribute from an increasingly small segment of product, uh, productive segment to an increasingly large um, uh, cash transfer recipient base. To me, that's, that, that kind of end, end point is, is, is impossible. It, 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 it can only end in ruin. And so it's something that I grapple with a lot because obviously cash transfers are extremely important right now and we need to expand it, but it's, it's not the answer for me. Um, I'm gonna come in. Um, so I know this is a discussion we've been having a lot uh, when we talk about basic incomes and uh, whether basic incomes themselves are merely reform uh, in a system that is clearly failing, an economic system that is clearly failing um, and is becoming the snake that eats itself to an extent. Um, but what I'm really interested in from, from you and Surbi, uh, Ihsan, is when you talk about methodologies in reframing labor and work through economics uh, at a university level, to what extent do you think there are interesting methodologies that are coming through? And is it possible for us in this session to maybe explore some of them uh, and think about them uh, in, a, in a way that would help with the refers work? going forward. The, the second session is, um, you know, the second session today, which is the closing session, is on uh, building institutional change. So I just want us to focus a bit on those methodologies so that when we do go to that session, it would be really cool to tie in all of the other interesting things that we've discussed now that uh, would, would enhance the discussion in a more practical sense. So that um, students who are on the call, academics who are on the call, people from civil society are all given an opportunity to kind of hone in on what the thoughts are on some of these methodologies. Right, so, sorry Shaya, this is actually my fault. I, I, we digressed and I, I, I also digressed and so on. Please don't apologize. I think that's a really important point though, because when we talk about labor and work and we talk about cash transfers, which is where the, 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 the focus is shifting globally with the pandemic, we can't have this discussion without thinking about what that means. So right. please don't apologize. Yeah. Yeah. I think this, the, the second part, uh, what we're going to hit into now, which is the question of identity, really d directly deals with some of the tools uh, available. So if, if that's okay, we can, we can transition into, into the, se the, the second topic. Okay, so um, just to look again at this. Uh, sorry, I'm being silly. Uh, okay. So... Uh, 
Can you see labor and identity on the screen? Yeah. Okay. So, so just to move into the yeah, second, how does labor and identity uh, look look like? So remember, we were just discussing over the last hour on about development and, and alternative approaches and, and problematizing it. We can also ask similar questions about labor and identity. And if you look at the current tools that are that are discussed within uh, kind of classic uh, uh, undergrad curricula, even honors level, even masters level. Um, I mean, all the way to, to PhD, uh, like uh, what I, uh, uh, yeah, in, in courses. Um, it's kind of the discussion of identity is very much, for example, centered uh, in, the, in, in the global north, for instance. And secondly, it's centered on kind of very strange uh, theories that are quite ahistorical. So um, this is just a, 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 one of the, a table which I love to show, which is showing, if you look at the top, 10 journals, economics journals, over the last uh, 30 years, actually. So it's about uh, 100 papers, 100 to 150 papers. Something like only 100 of those 100 papers, um, that's 1%, uh, actually mentions discrimination. It's incredible. Like, if you think about what are the main issues today, <laughs> inequality is very much up there. Um, and of those hundred, it's kind of all of the discussion is based on kind of statistical discrimination, which is this one weird interpretation of what drives discrimination. Um, and so we're going to speak a little bit about what are the alternative tools and, and, and thinking around discrimination. Survey. Thanks. Uh, excellent. So I, I guess what I'm going to try to link up in this particular top, to, uh, topic is to talk about three central things and uh, relating to the uh, question that Exan raised to begin with. First, we are talking, when we talk about the issue of labor and discrimination based on identity, there are uh, one, the, the basic set of problem is that is the what is the role of identity in the reproduction of the economic system itself, like identity-based oppression in the reproduction of economic system? That's kind of the first question for me, and I'll go into each of these uh, in a little bit of detail. The second question is that, um, how is it that discrimination takes place in the labor market? That's second. And the third of all is that, what are the tools available with much of economic thinking in terms of dealing with this discrimination and why and how they might be problematic and what could be some alternate frameworks. So first to talk about role of identity based oppression in the reproduction of the system. It's not, uh, I mean, it would be known to the, uh, all the audience here that slave trade and racism played an important role in the development of capitalism itself. As and when capitalism was, and sorry. And apartheid, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. So, so these were basically some of the base, some of the central ways through which the system came into being itself. One was, uh, you know, this historical sort of trajectory that we are talking about. And second that we're talking about is in terms of even in the current system, there's a huge subsidization of work that happens because of certain works being relegated to certain identities. And here I'm basically talking about, let's say, care work. If you know there is commodities to be produced in the factories, there is someone who has to produce the labor who goes and produces these commodities. And that is where the central aspect of care labor comes into being. So th these are just two small examples to basically say that either when we're looking at the historical reproduction of the system or the continued reproduction of the system, these identity-based oppressions play a really important role. And third mm -hmm. point that I want to kind of raise is... Uh, sorry, just maybe we, sorry, can speak, wants, yes. maybe we can speak directly to this, uh, this picture, which illustrates the, the, the role of, of care work on your point right now. Yeah, Isan, do you want to add something to it? Oh, just that this is that this this picture. This is from Federici. He speaks a lot about care work, uh, and it really um, illustrates it really well. Uh, because so, if, if, we, if we go back many slides, um, sorry. Oh, if we go back many slides to so this over here, the NDP, uh, like looking at uh, all this language about employment and growth and raising living standards and capabilities. 
but behind that is, that's already focusing on the factory itself, capitalism. But behind that is kind of the, the process, uh, this is like an illustration of all the care work that goes behind producing the labor that creates uh, those opportunities and growth and so on. Um, uh, it's a kind of uh, uh, a riff on the, um, on the virtuous circle uh, centering uh, care labor rather. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Exxon. Um, so yeah, so ex exactly. So that is what we're talking about, how in the reproduction of the system itself, uh, these identity-based oppressions play a really important role. But what has increasingly been happening is that these identities are increasingly being relegated to political and social sphere. You know, these are political questions. This is the reason how political fights are fought. These are the reasons where social policy is being made. But what gets lost out is these are not centered in the economic discourse on labor. Whereas having an economic discourse on labor without these identity questions, as we've just kind of tried to point to, is, is almost impossible. So which takes me to the second point then. So this was about you know, the, the identity-based oppression for reproduction system itself. Second point is that about discrimination in the labor market. And there comes a thing that why does discrimination exist? So what Shaira asked in terms of what are the tools available and whether those tools can work. Interestingly, one of the major theory uh, for saying that why does discrimination uh, exist came from Gary Becker, who argued people discriminate because people have a taste to discriminate. So you are basically ready to hire a white worker in your factory and pay uh, him a higher, him or her a higher wage just because you have a taste to discriminate against another identity. But for him, therefore, the solution also then said that, look, no, it would be the, the problem cannot persist in a competitive economy because these are the people who will be competed out automatically. So in his issue, in his uh, sort of understanding, it would be a market based solution to it. Isan probably can come in and talk about that why in, in this, uh, you know, sort of scenario, the labor market would not solve this problem because, you know, the, the issue of monopsony and all other things. Isan, do you want to come in here? Um, I mean, I think one um, way about it is that uh, if in, so a concrete example is that in South Africa, you have this, as we discussed earlier, this incredible spatial distribution uh, inherited uh, from apartheid and not changed very much in the last few years um, for, I mean, you can, it's where I grew up in Cape Town, it's, it's the most stark, uh, but you, I mean, in, in Joburg and many, many cities. Um, think about what are the costs in a very mechanical sense. If you have a firm in the center of town, and you have, for example, black workers that are mostly working on the, on, uh, far from the center of town. What are the wages that are needed in order to, um, in order to, for, for you to, for, for, for your travel, for example, to be covered? And it's obviously going to be much higher for black workers who are further from the site of the job than for other workers, white workers. Who, are, who reside closer for historical uh, reasons. Uh, that's one concrete example of how firms then have, have to pay higher for black workers. And of course, then it doesn't make sense. And so they hire the white workers. And it means that there's this kind of bolt in uh, labor market discrimination of white workers getting the highest paying jobs. Yeah, thanks, Ixan. Um, so yeah, that Actually, a perfect example. I didn't think about that one. Uh, but uh, interestingly, now this was in terms of saying, you know, how markets would clear and solve the issue. Another way in which it is seen is quite absurd and is basically one of the major ways uh, how much of the mainstream economics discourse explains discrimination. And they say that, look, there are actually differences in productive capacities of, let's say, two groups, blacks, whites, or men, women. And they say that that, uh, that differences agree, uh, that differences exist because, let's say, some groups had lower education and therefore have lesser productive capacities. On an average, if we know it to be true, then if I meet 
a woman or a black person or a brown woman, I know on an average they are less productive. So if someone comes to me and I do not have complete information that if they are, you know, an anomaly in the set, then it is rational for the employer to discriminate. And that is given as a reason as saying that, look, it's just a problem of incomplete information. So there develops the entire literature of complete information. How do you have better uh, information available? So that's where the entire sort of big discourse in economics comes into being, that it is rational to discriminate. Um, so, so uh, you know, people are just making a rational choice uh, by saying that uh, they would discriminate. But I guess this this sort of justification that is provided is, is then again problematic in various ways. Um, I'll go into that, but maybe Iksan, you want to come in here in terms of, uh, you know, talking a bit about the statistical discrimination bit and how it's this that it kind of tries to capture. No, I, I, I think you, you covered it. Uh, <laughs> maybe we should, and then we can go into more discussion just because there's 15 minutes left of the session. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so those are basically uh, two of the ways in which it's it's you know explained in the mainstream uh, economics discourse. But there's increasingly an interesting school of th uh, you know idea that's coming from mainly Marxist feminist economists who are talking about this idea of social reproduction theory, which I personally feel is a very powerful tool, and I think Iksan would agree uh, on on that note. Where the argument is that look, this sort of systemic reproduction that happens doesn't happen without these identity-based discriminations and these identity-based oppressions. So you cannot understand the economic system and the reproduction of the economic system without talking about these identity-based uh, oppression and the reproduction of these oppressions. So there they make this argument of saying that if you have to deal with these problems, you have to look at the problem in the economic as well. So for example, one of the general ways in which economics discrimination is looked at as saying that, oh, we're looking at, we, you know, that standard regression framework where we look at difference in wages and control for the occupation of the workers as well, among other things. But a lot of discrimination actually manifests itself in different occupation itself. Women are relegated to certain occupations, identities in terms of caste, color, etc., are relegated to certain occupations. And what we then find in terms of a difference in wage you know, difference in wages between men and women or different uh, identities is basically only going to reflect the ch difference in wages controlling for their occupation. Whereas this sort of segmentation that exists in the labor market, which can't just go away if you have more competition or anything, if women are relegated to the services that are increasingly or, you know, other identities being relegated to the services that are going to increasingly being, uh, you know, uh, uh, have low wages, that is not, so having more competition in the market, wouldn't it, would it in itself not solve the issue as well as well. So that leaves us with three important questions, which I think is critical researchers and thinkers we need to think about. One, Maybe. can the problem of, yeah. Sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, I'll come. Okay. I just wanted to give an so example. Can the problem uh, of identity, be, yeah, please do. <laughs> so it's okay, I think there's a lag. Please go ahead, uh, then I'll add in. Uh, just an example of, uh, I, I think one application of social reproduction theory, uh, as I understand it, <laughs> um, is that um, that of, for example, uh, uh, domestic work. So we can think about care labor uh, in the care economy as that's not part of the, not part of the remunerate, formally remunerated economy. And then it's not counted as part of wages, not counted national income, but obviously that work still happens. And kind of the, the clearest juxtaposition for me is that as soon as that very same labor is, uh, is kind of remunerated um, through the commodification of those processes. So for example, uh, you have uh, the domestic worker industry, you have the, the care of elderly industry, um, even to some extent the, the uh, schools themselves uh, fulfill these, these functions. Um, as soon as you formalize the, 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 or you commodify the aspects of it, it suddenly becomes remunerated. And that means that kind of one way to think through this is that if we recognize the care part of the economy as, an, an, as essential pr productive aspects of the economy, we can then think of possibilities outside 
of the capitalist uh, production framework for which these care for which, for which these care activities can be remunerated and empowered in a productive capacity. So for example, there was, um, I mean, I, I, I don't know much about it, but there, there was the, 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 the uh, wages for work, for care work campaign. Um, and to some, some extent, as, as, as we've seen in many of the, of the calls for the basic income guarantee, uh, some of the calls are also linked to um, recognizing the care work uh, that, that happens. Um, uh, another example, interestingly, that I just found out is that in some of these community works programs from the government, there are lots of problems with it. But one of the things that they do, which is kind of cool, is that uh, it, the community works programs are decided at the government level, and they include, for example, uh, communities deciding to uh, recognize as productive work the, uh, the, the uh, uh, caring of the elderly, uh, and then that's remunerated through the community works program. Uh, through a government kind of uh, uh, process, which is, I mean, linked to the capitalist, uh, capitalist development process, but does open our vision as to how these, the social reproduction theory, thinking about identities, really allows us to think more widely about growth and development um, in the economy. Just an example. Thanks, Obi. Just add one point and probably uh, then end here, end here and open for discussion unless Iksan wants to add something to it. Uh, so, so, you know, the interesting point then is that even when these works are paid for, let's say there's care work happening at home, but now the woman doing the, the care work for her, uh, I mean, for the family, but basically since it's, the, uh, it's relegated mainly to uh, women. But then again, what happens is that this kind of care work is paid way less. Reason being that there is what you know, Nancy Fulbright calls the care penalty. Just because this, this work is basically relegated to women and you know, in US context identities, which are mainly Blacks and Latinos, just the fact that they were being done by that identity they are actually depreciated and devalued more. And the emotional labor that goes into the entire performance of care work is almost seen as a gender or an identity aspect and is then not paid for. So I think that leaves us with three questions which I think are kind of important. One, in terms of in the current system that we are in, can we solve this problem of issue of identity-based oppression? Like, is it possible? Because we started building the discussion by saying that, look, they played a very important role in the system itself. So can that solve the problem? For example, you know, black excellence, having more black capitalists, in Indian case, having more Dalit capitalists, does that solve the issue? Second question that we have now is in terms of, but even if that identity-based uh, problem gets solved, do we solve the problem of, um, worker oppression, because much of the mainstream idea would actually talk about, assume that both worker and the employer have same power when they're entering into this free contract of labor, which it might not. So that's the second question. And third question then is that um, if at all one was to talk about a system which is not capitalist then, then without engaging with these issues of oppression, can we even think about an ideal world which will, in 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 an absolute sense, be better? And that's where we want to link these questions of exploitation and identity-based oppression. Exxon, um, do you want to come in? No, I, I think we should open up. Uh, if anyone has any Thanks questions. so much, Surbi and Ihsan. You've you've really allowed us to go through a thought process with you, and that's been really incredible for me because we started off with looking at labor and development we then looked at identities and we wrapped up really nicely when thinking about specific examples of methodologies that can allow an opening of our imagination to viewing labor and work in a very different way through economics um, but what's also really come out is that the institutions themselves so the universities themselves and the economic systems that they are based in um, cannot be changed just by rethinking the economics curriculum uh, within our courses. Uh, there's agitation work that needs to take place both inside the institution and outside the institution. And so 
we've got some people from civil society here. We've also got some academics and students. I really want to open up to them in the last 10 minutes to get a sense of what they're thinking of, uh, you know, has been on the presentation, but also going into the next session, which is the closing plenary uh, at 2.30. Uh, um, how do we build institutional change? And that's a question that you can refer to uh, if you have any thoughts on in the Google document. But for now, any final questions to Surbi and Ihsan? And then after that, we'll end off um, at half past. So I have a question. Um, and it's, do you think that there's any papers or resources that present a simple enough version of um, labor reproduction, well, what do you call it? Um, care work and social reproduction that both models could be included in an undergrad syllabus, even at a first year level. I know there's this one book which is very interesting, but I think by similar authors, but I think that's a graduate level textbook, but by similar authors, I think there's some really interesting pieces that one can look at. So this is this book called Social Reproduction Theory. Uh, it's by, it's edited by Titi Bhattacharya and it has some really interesting work, particularly by Nancy Fraser on the price of care and Nancy Fraser's work just generally also how social identities and exploitation kind of goes like uh, capitalist exploitation, work exploitation goes hand in hand is amazing. There's this one of her articles, uh, which is called is capitalism necessarily racist. That's the title, which is a very interesting read. So I would definitely recommend that. In terms of social reproduction theory to think about sexuality, Alan Sears has some uh, interesting work that people might want to uh, look at. And then finally, this question of that, do we want to then talk about systemic changes? And how can we think about these identity-based movements? So, you know, India is now having a Dalit, which is a caste-based, you know, India is a very caste based society, I was about to say casteist society, which would also be true, uh, but basically um, the caste based society and uh, there's this huge thing going on about Dalit Lives Matter, which is synonymous to, you know, the Black Lives Matter in the US uh, right now. And, and how these sort of social identity based movements can go and question the system itself is, if you want to look at that, there's this really important work by Chinzia Aruza on feminist strikes, uh, which you might be interested in as well. Surbi, um, if you can, before you leave, uh, just share the titles that you've mentioned in the chat, please. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I'd like to say, like, thank you very much for the, the presentation. And I must have bit of the early part, so maybe this was covered, covered already, but um, uh, in terms of like like the discrimination um, in the labor market, there's like uh, lots of evidence to show that uh, being part of a union but like helps reduce the levels of um, uh, gender gaps and uh, other sorts of discrimination in um, in the labor market. Um, but like when it comes to 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 places like and then this. Uh, because it's like segmented um, in very gendered ways where um, the informal sectors and domestic workers and uh, care work is much more difficult to organize. Um, what, if you can speak to the limitations and maybe the possibilities of organizing in those places uh, to overcome exploitation in, in these particularly precarious um, and discriminatory uh, segments of the labor market. Uh, I, I don't know if I was clear, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think so. Um, I, I can speak to that uh, briefly. Uh, I wanna make two points. Uh, I think the question of unions is super important for both um, class, the question of class inequality as well as um, discrimination. Just in t firstly, in terms of inequality, I think one really uh, one important thing which I think is is uh, wrong in which 
uh, unions are, treat, are, 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 are kind of dealt with in curricula is that unions are generally thought of as kind of the union premium, which as that goes up, you, you, uh, it is insiders within the firm that uh, create rents. Uh, if this is familiar to anyone who's, who's with, with that kind of demand supply graph, you above the equilibrium and, and you push out some workers and create unemployment. Uh, and that's really said as, as one of the kind of uh, reasons behind unemployment in South Africa, um, you know, which might be part of the story, uh, it's true, uh, but I really don't think is, is, is a large part of the story at all. Um, uh, I do want to say that, that specifically in terms of unions, uh, I think that the approach of exploitation is really useful uh, there because uh, one of the primary functions of the union is to uh, look at the profits of a company and to redistribute the, the, the share of profits from uh, owners of the company or high managers towards uh, low, lower income parts of the, of, of, the, of the economy. And that kind of income level distribution is really, at least in my experience, both in uh, undergrad and graduate studies was never dealt with in relation to the union story. And it's really the central question of what unions do in terms of, in terms of when you look at Marikana, you look at uh, union protests in general, uh, it's like we need to reduce exploitation. We need to reduce the amount of profit cut that the company is taking. It's not, to, it's, it's, I mean, there's, um, there's, the focus is on the profits of the company, not really about the labor income distribution within the, within the labor. There's the thing of, uh, a, a tool to to kind of think about, I think, uh, challenge in the curriculum. In terms of the in terms of the um, the, the the gender bias uh, 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 nature of the organization of unions, uh, I have, uh, um, I don't like in my own work. I don't focus a lot on uh, on that at all. But um, I think it's an extremely in, important question, especially given in South Africa, you have this historical uh, uh, organization, especially around, for example, bargaining councils, which are really focused, for example, on the manufacturing and the uh, transport sectors and the mining sectors, for example, uh, all very much, um, uh, the last time I looked, uh, 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 more male-based uh, kind of industries, whereas the, the uh, bargaining councils within uh, more, more women-based industries uh, are, very, are lacking strongly. If you look at uh, informalized work specifically of, the, of domestic workers, but also in the service industry, very badly unionized, uh, very few uh, uh, institutions of central bargaining. I think one way to look at, like concretely to go forward with that um, is to kind of rethink about the historical origins of these, of these central bargaining institutions, uh, these collective bargaining institutions, uh, and, and, and think about, well, we've had an expansion of these service industries, uh, which are more women-based. Uh, it means that there is a potential for, um, uh, you know, new organization of, 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 of institutions uh, by industry. Uh, I don't have anything more, and I know my friends have actually spoken about this. I think it's an extremely important question uh, that really needs a lot of attention. Thanks. If if everyone is okay to uh, just share any further questions they have with us via email, we can send it to Ihsan and Surbi because we have unfortunately run out of time. Um, and I do want people to get a bit of a break before the closing plenary, which starts at half past two. Um, we really appreciate uh, your contributions, Surbi and Ihsan. I know that you're both uh, dynamic and young academics. Um, in, in economics, and we, 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 we really benefited a lot from hearing your perspectives, especially because both of you have been involved in decolonization and rethinking economics work in your own context. Surbi, um, there's some really great work that the Rethinking Economics Collective in India has been doing. I know you and Ihsan were on a platform there uh, previously. So if there's any materials that you think would be good for us to have a look at, even from other pluralist economics um, spaces that you're involved in, please do share that with us and we'll make sure that it gets to participants. Um, to participants, you've been really patient with us. Um, you've engaged so well with um, the speakers and we've learned so much from all of you as well. So thank you so much from me and the co-facilitators. Um, we do have forms that you can uh, stream before the end of the weekend. Um, and uh, pop the link there so that you, you have them before we go. Um, and you can watch them anytime. Uh, so please check some of them out. Uh, I do think that 
from yesterday's presentation when we heard from uh, Jonathan, uh, it's interesting to see how film and storytelling and narratives play such an important role in how we, we learn. And that is also central to uh, the work that RIFA does um, to create also a space for interdisciplinarity. So thank you again, and we'll see you at the closing plenary at half past two. The link is uh, over there in the chat. It's not going to be this link. Uh, we'll be using the closing plenary link. So don't forget about that. And we'll catch, catch you there. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks so much, thanks, everyone. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks, everyone. Yeah, it was enriching. And I learned a lot from you guys. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Prof.